Okay, thank you all for coming. So my presentation is about imaging monoaminergic systems and their pharmacological control. And I'd like to start you off with a bigger picture, namely with the question, how can re neuroscience really change the world? What are we all about here to do? What do we aim to do? In what ways can we actually impact the world around us? And it's actually quite simple. If you think that technology and science are the things which move the world forward, you'd have to ask yourself, okay, where do we as neuroscientists fit in? Uh, have we moved the world forward? Because if you look at other sciences, even much more modern, uh, modest sciences, uh, for instance, microbiology, have moved the world forward quite a bit, whereas neuroscience, still not so much. So what would we have to do to really change the world via our work? The first thing which we might want to do is facilitate the betterment of the human mind. That is what we study, the human mind, and via science and technology, we should be able to better it. This can both mean making the diseased mind healthy again, but it can also mean making the healthy mind better. This would be the applied science angle. Uh, you could also say that we can make the world better by, uh, by contributing to basic science, and that basically means explaining the things which we find relevant about the brain in a more, in a more natural scientific fashion. Not least of all, engineering and methods development can also have a great impact. And of course, if we are to create methods which are impactful and which can impact a lot of different sciences and have a lot of downstream effects on the real world, we should develop methods which can be shared and reproduced and integrate well with other research. Now, are there any parts of the brain which we could try to look at in particular, anything which is particularly relevant for brain application? Here, I'd like to draw your attention to monoaminergic systems, which are a, cla a, a, a class of neurotransmitters uh, which are prominently implicated in deficiencies in emotion as well as in, of course, diseases of emotion. And you can see here a monoaminergic centric representation of different emotions uh, compiled by a psychologist uh, and this gives you, although this isn't a really good qualitative descri uh, descriptor of the state of the matter, it gives you a very good idea of all of the phenomena which these neurotransmitter systems are implicated in. Um, not least of all, if we are to look at them, this would be like the, what I just said is more like the applied part, but if we are to look at them, there's also a lot of basic research relevance, uh, simply because these neurotransmitter systems are centered in the brainstem, they have very few cells which are very strongly uh, similar to each other and which project throughout the brain, meaning that if you are to think of the brain as an, a graph, then the monoaminergic systems are basically very relevant as true node-like structures, which might not uh, be said so easily about parts, other parts of the brain. Uh, of course, being implicated in, in such myriad of interesting phenomena, monoaminergic systems are often the target of psychopharmacology very, very many drugs. This includes, of course, therapeutic drugs in the treatment of anxiety, depression, attention deficit. It can also include neuroenhancing drugs, which improve focus and attention. Uh, it can include, include recreational drugs and also drugs which are addictive. Of course, there is an overlap between addictive drugs and the other categories. Uh, and all of these categories are interesting to study. We want better therapeutics. Ideally, we want to be able to enhance the brain. Uh, how we stand on recreation is, uh, is a more or less uh, diverse uh, set of opinions, and addiction, well, that's something which we definitely want to treat. Uh, and if you look at the monoaminergic synapses, you will notice that there is a very strong homology in the molecular biological structure. That means that by interrogating one monoaminergic system, we can try to transfer and compare and contrast that knowledge with some of the others. So it is a very well integrated set of research questions which we can look at. So what are our aims? What do I want to do as part of this work? So first of all, uh, ideally, let's start with the technology. We want technologies which are reproducible and reusable so that whatever we find out can be transferred to other labs and companies and so on. Uh, I would like to establish a monoaminergic imaging assay. Can we really capture monoaminergic function at the whole brain level via imaging? And the last thing is once we have such an assay, let's try to use it and see if we can actually uh, implement this method to find out more about phenomena of interest, which in this case is psycho psychopharmacology. I use the word endophenotype. This basically means uh, a phenotype which is more cellular or more molecular biological than what you would see at the level of the whole organism of behavior. And that is something which we would basically attempt to get from this imaging assay. Now let's start first of all with, with the basics. So, 
in order to do any sort of data analysis, you need a lot of software. Software uses other software, and that software in turn uses more software. There's a there are a lot of dependencies, and this complexity explodes, and you have hundreds, if not thousands, of packages which are required. Ideally, we can manage this all in one step so that we ca can guarantee at one junction that as easily as possible, a system, an environment is reproducible. We do this by using the Gentoo Linux Package Manager, and additionally, this Package Manager allows us to use software directly from source. This is very important because if you want to attain reproducibility, you want to have a connection between something which you can understand and something else which you can understand. You can understand the source code, you can understand the results. You cannot understand the binaries in the middle. So it is very important that software environments are constructed from source. Uh, as part of this effort, we have contributed over 60 packages to this uh, management system so that they can be automatically managed to reproduce our environments. And of course, we have implemented technologies to have basically a one-stop, if not necessarily one-click environment reproduction. All of our articles are software packages with dependencies. If you've looked at the, at the links in, uh, in the document, you can see that you can just download one of the articles, install all of the dependencies, and ideally reproduce all of my results, including the statistics from the raw data. Uh, data processing is a rather lengthy uh, topic, but let me give you a short overview of what this looks like in, uh, in fMRI or magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, and you start basically with the data acquisition in the scanner on proprietary software, which we cannot interact with too much. And then you go into another system where you perform the analysis. The upper version is what is currently done. As, and as you can see, it is very ad hoc. The metadata is separated. It's put in manually at different stages. This impedes transferability of an assay and impedes reproducibility and gives a lot of chances for mistakes to be made. So what we want to do instead of an ad hoc, ad hoc meaning for this um, solution to data processing, we want to have data processing which is general purpose, so true software packages for data processing. And this is what we have established here. And I'd like to draw your attention to these golden colored arrows because these relate to the two bigger software packages which we've created. The first one goes from the data standard, the proprietary broker data standard, to BIDS, which is a shareable data standard, which you can see here. Uh, it is very important that we have this piece of software which basically can convert the broker data, which is somewhat well documented, into this BITS format, which is completely open and documented, and of course, to which you can contribute, meaning that it, if, if it is broken, you're not necessarily uh, have to rely on a company moving along, but you can just edit it, update it, and then it's no longer broken. Um, this is important not just because it creates shareable data, but because it renders the broker data itself shareable. Now that this package exists, people who have broker data can share it because it can be translated in a form which can be automatically interpretable. Uh, the second part is, of course, improving the registration. So if you go back slowly so that I don't confuse you to this part, this is the second arrow from the raw volumetric data to the pre-processed volumetric data. This is called registration. And here we have taken one of the ad hoc pipelines, which was used successfully in our lab. This is not a bad pipeline, but we have, in, but we have improved it greatly with regard to both the workflow and the template. Uh, and we have compared this in a multivariate statistic, and we have determined that, of course, our new version with the new template and the new workflow, which is basically this, this one in green, uh, con uh, contrasts very favorably with the old version, which is the old workflow with the old template. Uh, does any of this matter? I mean, is it just some, some technical details or does it impact science in a meaningful way? And I would argue that, of course, it impacts science in a meaningful way. What we have now is we have analysis environments which are reproducible, meaning that they can be recreated by collaborators who want to reproduce our work or who want to derive our work anywhere and which is hackable. This is very important simply because just having binaries does not mean that you can continue the research because you do not have insight in code which is compiled. You have insight in source code and having built these environments from source, they are hackable. You can download it, you can edit it, you can make it better to serve your purpose. Uh, we have established a shareable data representation for small animal MRI data. This BIDS format is very widely used in human MRI. Now it is also accessible to animal MRI, meaning that people who are proficient in the analysis of human MRI can more easily uh, use their knowledge to also improve our understanding of mouse fMRI. 
Uh, and of course, we have uh, reusable and incrementally improvable workflows, which here is our registration workflow. Uh, it's a software package which can be reused and it's completely open source, meaning that it can be incrementally improved. Okay, now I have all of these cool tools. What do we do with them? Well, the first thing which we wanted to do with them is to establish a fingerprint for one of the monoaminergic systems, which in this case is dopamine. The technique which we use to do this is called opto-fMRI. It is a mixture of optogenetics and functional magnetic resonance imaging. Optogenetics allows us to stimulate cells based on their location. The location is selected by the injection site of a vector and by the introduction site of light into the brain and by their cell type. The cell type is selected by a transgenic line. This means that we can selectively target dopaminergics, so just the monoamines, which we are interested in, in one of the nuclei, which I've talked to you about, which can be thought of as true nodes in the brain graph representation. And this mixture of methods is truly excellent simply because you have access to the node, which is very localized with a lot of cells which are similar, but you measure their effects at the whole brain level. The brain is a systemic organ. It doesn't make sense to tear it apart or at least it doesn't make a lot of sense in many cases to tear it apart. Ideally, you want an assay which covers it at a glance, and this is what OptoFMRI can do. Uh, we have uh, not only done this work to establish a fingerprint, we have done a multivariate analysis, we have varied a lot of parameters. Here we see that block stimulation can elicit VTA, which is one of the nuclei in which these dopaminergic cells are located, activity, but phasic stimulation by comparison not so much, and we have identified those sites which are most promising to target uh, with this procedure. Yeah, so the, this is basically a cross-section of the brain. These are the front to back, so the rostrocaudal coordinates, and here you have the bottom to top, so the ventrodorsal co coordinates. Well, dorsoventral, as the case may be. Uh, and what does this assay look like in the end? Well, it looks like this, uh, and this is the whole brain dopaminergic function map. So we have stimulated the dopaminergic uh, neurons in the VTA, and we have measured what activity this elicits at the whole brain level. And we see two large clusters of activation in the midbrain, of course, where you would expect the VTA to be. This is the primary site. This is where the fiber goes in. If you look very carefully, there's one voxel missing right there. There's a small hint at what, where, where the fiber might converge from all of the animals which are registered and summed together. And there's another large cluster which is more rostral, so more towards the front, uh, which is in the dorsal, well, not, uh, which is mainly in the ventral, but also in some of the dorsal striatum. This is interesting because this covers some of the regions which we know that the VTA projects to, but not all of them. So this might have some relevance in uncovering why exactly this difference is, but it is already an assay which can be used to interrogate other interventions. It can already be thought of as an endophenotype of normal dopaminergic function. Of course, it's lateralized. This is an important consideration because this is a paired nucleus and we have stimulated primarily towards one side. Uh, is this important? Is this fingerprint relevant? Does, does, this, uh, does this make a neuroscience world changing? Well, not, not in and of itself, uh, but of course, it is important. First of all, it gives us a proof of principle that all of the theory which I've talked to you earlier about how this method is so appropriate and so on, does in fact apply to the mouse VTA and dopaminergic systems. Uh, we have specified, uh, including a lot of special parameters, uh, an assay which can be used to interrogate this, uh, this neurotransmitter system and its function. And in addition to this, we already have a summary for what the baseline function looks like. So if somebody has another summary, so another statistical map of the same assay in a disease model or upon drug administration, that can already be compared to what we have and we can see in how far does this affect the dopaminergic system and in how far is effect, this effect imageable. So of course, this is the theory. Does it work? Can we, can we take this and go to an intervention and see if, uh, if it is uh, variable? Uh, and this is the second part of what we've tried to do. So we've, we've taken a different assay, not for the dopaminergic system, but the exact same thing for the serotonergic system, which is another monoamine system, and we have applied it in conjunction with pharmacology, opto-pharmaco-fMRI. Again, opto-fMRI as before, optogenetics for stimulation, fMRI for whole brain imaging, and additionally a pharmacological intervention, which you can see here. Basically, you have a treatment in fluoxetine and in parallel a control, and all of these boxes show the dates when the animal was imaged. 
So these are the reapplications of this assay, which I've talked to you about. We have a na naive application. We have an acute application where the animal gets the drug intravenously, so acutely, very fast. Uh, and then we have another two, which interrogate the drug administration over drinking water uh, after two weeks and after four weeks at the post-administration session. Let's make a short excursion, which is perhaps more appropriate here than the introduction, uh, and look at the fact that using opto-fMRI and using imaging for these monoaminergic systems is actually, in addition to all of the advantages which I've talk, talk, told you about, very relevant, simply because at the whole brain level, if you think here's the node, here's where the cell bodies are, and these are all of the projections, which as you can see cover a lot of the brain, at the whole brain level, even this macroscopic resolution can actually map onto cellular biology, simply because these neurons are very, very long. That means that the cell body is in one voxel here, whereas the synapses, so the terminals, many, many voxels away. They are in the projection areas. And this basically allows us to make at least speculative interpretations about the sites where pharmacological substances might act and how they might do so. And the substance which we study here is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. This is a substance for which the mechanism of action is not perfectly clarified. Uh, basically, if you look at this map here, the green dots are serotonin. These two ovals here are the serotonin transporter. They take serotonin back in after it was released in order to reuse it or to degrade it. Uh, what selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors do is they block it, which means that serotonin accumulates outside the cell. And you think, okay, well, potentiate serotonin tra serotonergic transmission, big deal. Well, that's not all, simply because if you look, you have these autoreceptors, these 5-HT1, 5-HT1A receptors, which are inhibitory. And these also react to serotonin. So what happens if serotonin accumulates extracellularly? Does the activation go up or down? It's an interesting question, which maybe we can address. Uh, first of all, we have reproduced the initial assay. So in the drug naive condition, reproduction is an important part of science. We need to make sure that the things we, which we talk about can be redone by others. And of course, this one could. This is done by collaborators. This is done by us. You see, dopa, uh, you see serotonergic activation. You see activation of the serotonergic nuclei in the brainstem and deactivation in the projection areas. And we reapply this assay over all of these sessions. So let's look at the place where all of the cell bodies are, which I've talked to you about, the dorsal raphe. And we look at it, how it evolves over time, and we notice that uh, there is no, not really any effect in the vehicle condition. In the floxetina condition, there is a significant effect only in the chronic administration sessions, which is very interesting, simply because that means that this nucleus became so, somehow more sensitized. This is in line with one of the main hypotheses of SSRI action, which is um, downregulation of autoinhibition. Yeah? Uh, how can we look at the rest of the brain? Well, we can try to separate the, the points, the voxels in the rest of the brain based on their temporal profiles so that we can see if we find any distinct trends. And this is what we have done with uh, Gaussian mixture models. Uh, and we have identified four clusters. Uh, we're going to look at the two most relevant clusters, which is the green, the brainstem cluster, and the blue, the cortical cluster. The brainstem cluster has a similar time course to what you've seen in the dorsal raphe. It's important to note it's not the same as the dorsal raphe. The dorsal raphe is where the nuclei are and where you see activation in the drug naive condition. The, this is a much larger area where in the drug naive condition you don't see a lot of activation. That means that during drug administration, particularly during chronic drug administration, you get strong positive signaling in the brainstem. Very, very strong, highly significant. In the cortex, you have a different profile where you basically have a very strong effect. So the inhibition is potentiated during the acute administration, but much less so during the chronic administration. This is totally in line with the, auto, with the downregulation of autoinhibition hypothesis, simply because it means that at the beginning, more serotonin is there, the signaling is potentiated, but over time, the neurons adapt to this condition by becoming more sensitized by downregulating autoinhibition. Is this relevant? Well, I think it is. Uh, it is very illuminated, illuminating for SSRI research. It's, it explains the mechanics, uh, and it gives us a proof of principle for the fact that what I said about the applicability of these fingerprints is indeed true. They're highly sensitive, much more sensitive than behavior. Uh, we have imaging-based support for this theory of monoaminergic function. And we have brainstem stimulation, 
which is this most salient effect which we've seen as perhaps one of the most important mediators of SSRI action since the effect is the strongest. Um, what I haven't talked about too long, but what's also important is that in these last sessions, in no cluster do you see an effect, meaning that the homeostasis rebounds. This might have actually clinical relevance simply because there is a huge worry about SSRIs being overprescribed. And the question is, can we break something permanently in the healthy brain by prescribing SSRIs when we shouldn't have? And the answer here is no. Uh, that brings us to the end of my presentation, the outlook, what can we do based on all of these technologies? Well, we could do the same which we've done for the serotonergic assay to a dopaminergic assay. We could try to use an analogous substance, a dopamine reuptake inhibitor, of which there are very many which are very interesting in the clinic and beyond. Another thing which we could do given these technologies is apply them to the noradrenergic system. We've talked about monoamines, of which there are three main monoamines. We've looked at two. Why not look at the third? Of course, there are people, I, I believe, already working on this. Uh, monoamines aren't the only uh, nuclei, the only neurotransmitter systems for which all of the rationale which I've talked about applies. The same thing applies for neuropeptidergic systems. Small nuclei, similar cells project widely throughout the brain. Uh, we could try to apply these assays concurrently simply because these, nu these nuclei are interconnected and it is a relevant question. In how far is their activity cumulative or in how far is there very strong interaction. Uh, not least of all, I believe that this, these fingerprints could be translated to a human reference space that would of course be highly speculative, but since we have these maps, these endophenotypes of monoaminergic function, if we can map them to atlas parcellation, then we can map them back to a human reference space. Of course, we cannot do optofMRI in humans, but this can help inform and, and work as a region of interest constraint in the analysis of human data. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening, and I'm very happy to, uh, to receive your questions.